Hello, welcome to Devlin's Mondo Nostalgia Radio Show. And I am here. I decided to keep the momentum going. I had a brand new episode up last week, so let's do two in a row. Maybe this will help me incentive to get back onto a regular regular rotation with this thing. How are you doing today? Thank you for pressing play and joining me today. I got a lot to talk about and a lot of nostalgia. I know sometimes I veer off and talk about personal stuff, but today it's pretty much nostalgia. Well, of course it's personal stuff because usually when I talk about nostalgia, I talk about how uh, it affects me. And so, you know, I have to do that. Um, yeah, we're going to do some catch-up to start things off, and then we're going to do a mishmash of everything. I may even even have a movie review in there as well. And, uh, yeah, so uh, stick around, grab yourself a beverage, grab yourself a snack, whatever you like to do to listen to podcasts. You know, if you're in traffic, keep an eye on the road. I'll try not to be so charming if you are in traffic listening to me. Thank you. Whatever device you're listening to me. Uh, anyhow, uh, first of all, I want to do some catch-ups because uh, there were some, during my hiatus uh, for a couple of months, there were some big uh, celebrity deaths. And I don't want to touch on all of them because I don't want to do a, a whole episode just on, like, death. Because I think that, you know, even though... I plan to pay tribute to these people. I don't want it to be like a big death party, but there were a lot of deaths in the last couple of months, uh, celebrity ones. Uh, a couple of ones that I'll just mention, uh, George Bush, you know, former president. Uh, Roy Clark, you know, the star of Hee Haw and just one of the great banjo players of our time. Uh, Ray Sawyer, who was the one of the founding members of Dr. Hook, a group I always loved growing up and still love their music. And Ken Berry, who was in shows like F Troop and Mama's Family. Uh, he doesn't get a lot of the love that um, he should because he, he's one of those guys that kind of, he's been in a lot of things and people know him, but people just don't talk about him. And so I want to at least give him a shout out. And there were so many other ones, Mean Gene, uh, Oakland, uh, just just so many that there's just too many to mention but there were three big ones in the last couple of months that i do want to touch upon and i'm going to start with stan lee um i know stan lee probably more now because of his cameos in the marvel movies uh and i know a lot of people when he passed away you know were very touched by his death and and i was too but probably not as much as everyone else i'm not saying i i, I wasn't saddened for it i'm just saying that i grew up kind of more in a dc realm but it's interesting i know some creators of the dc comics but it's funny how i actually know of stan lee more uh i i didn't get into marvel comics um I read a couple when I was growing up, but I wasn't a big fan of Marvel until the movies, the the Marvel Cinematic Universe, started developing. Uh, although I did watch quite a bit of Spider-Man from the, you know, 67 animated series to, you know, some of the early uh, Carnets and movies and stuff. So, you know, I, I, I knew of Spidey and stuff. I remember him on the Electric Company and stuff. But uh, Stan Lee did a lot. And uh, he, not just even in his comic book things, but he inspired generations uh, through his comics and just through the kind of person he was. And I felt I needed to talk a little bit about it. The first time I probably really remember Stan Lee is when I used to go camping. I had a lot of exposure to more Marvel and DC comics because uh, they used to have a big stack of comics ranging from everything from Richie Rich to Batman to Green Arrow to some Spider-Man. And I'd read them. And what we'd do is, you know, you know, camping, I was always out, you know, getting fresh air and stuff. But for anybody who knows camping, sometimes that just doesn't happen. Sometimes there's a bad day. And when that happens, you're stuck inside. And we were in a trailer, so it wasn't too bad. But uh, the comics would come out at that point when we were done playing games and stuff like that. And we'd all just kind of our, our quiet time. And I always remember the Marvel comics because I'd remember the little, you know, Stan Lee logo. 
And, uh, you know, I had a bit of an ego. The reason I actually remembered the Stan Lee was because my middle name, which I don't know if I've ever revealed here, is Stanley. I got my father's name, and, uh, and when I saw how he used to put his name Stan Lee, I always remember saying, hey, that's cool. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't like the name Stanley. You know, I was honored that it was my dad's, but I didn't feel it. I was more honored as I grew up and I realized how awesome it was that I had my dad's name. But when you're a kid, everything, you know, everything is just, you know, I hate that. I hate this. I hate that. And, you know, having the name Stanley, it was, you know, I kept thinking of Stanley Roper, you know, uh, Norman Fell's character from the company. But when I saw Stan Lee and remembered, like, he created these characters, Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four and the Hulk and the X-Men and all so on and so on, I thought, hey, that's cool. Stan Lee is a cool name to have. So that was my bout with uh, Stan Lee. And then, of course, I've just absolutely loved all the Marvel films. And I love his um, little parodies, like his little, not parodies, his uh, guest appearances in it. I love that he did that where, you know, in pretty much all the Marvel movie universe, he shows up. And I love the different ways he's shown up. Ones that... I remember off the top of my head that I loved was the one where he played um, uh, Hugh Hefner in one. I love that one. I can't remember. I want to say that's an Iron Man one. I love the second Fantastic Four movie where he uh, comes to the wedding of um, uh, Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Girl. And he's like, what do you mean I'm not on the guest list? I have to be on the guest list. I really like that one. And then in one of the Spider-Man movies, I want to say it was one of the Andrew Garfield ones, he does a great one for um, where he's like in a library listening to a Walkman when this battle's going on. And it just kind of escalates. And he, he misses all of it because he's listening to his music. And it, it's just a wonderful cameo. He's had so many great ones. But those are the ones that popped into my head while I was talking about him. And of course, he leaves a legacy that will go on forever. You know, the MCU has way over 20 movies in it now. And the cool thing about not only leaving that history, but there's rumors that he's actually filmed a couple of the cameos. So when we see stuff like um, Captain Marvel or Avengers Endgame, we still might get to see a little Stan, so that'd be great. But anyhow, read up about Stan, because I read up, up a lot about him after his death, and I was just amazed at how, how much he's touched people's lives, not just in the comic book universe, but just being just a standout guy. Um, another death that happened just recently is uh, Daryl Dragon. Uh, some of you might not know that name. In fact, I remember putting this article on... Uh, Mondo Nostalgia, my Facebook page, shameless plug, and somebody said, hey, I never knew his name before, but he was more known as the Captain, and that would be in the duo The Captain and Tennille. Now, for you youngins, you probably don't know who The Captain and Tennille is, unless you're really into your retro music, but when you grew up in the 70s, and maybe even in the 80s a little bit, The Captain and Tennille were one of the biggest duos around. They got their start... Um, in uh, with the song Love Will Keep Us Together, which, boy, if you grew up in 1975, you knew that song because that song was everywhere. It became the big song of that year, and it was just everywhere. And they came out like gangbusters, and they had about six years of just big, big hits, you know, songs like Shop Around and uh, Lonely Night Angel Face and Muskrat Love and, you know, uh, you never did me like that. And then, oddly, if you go by the Billboard chart, they actually ended their career on a number one as well. They started on a number one and ended it because their last top 40 single was called Do That To Me One More Time, which basically kicked off the 80s, and then that was pretty much them. In that time, they were celebrities in a big way. They were a married couple, and they had musical you know, they they just were really big at the time. They even had a short-lived variety show, which Mike and I actually own some of the episodes. Uh, we bought a DVD package, and we like to put it on because it, they're so awkward. 
uh, Tony Tennille, you know, she doesn't get enough recognition for her voice, but she was a little bit awkward when she tried to dance and stuff, which made it very charming. And if you want to talk about awkward, the captain, Daryl Dragon, really did not like being in front of the camera. I think he totally did it for his wife. And you can tell. And they work it into the show sometimes, too. But there's bad puns. Anybody who grew up for, with variety shows know that there was bad skits, bad puns, you know, classic, you know, um, uh, special guest appearances from people from, like, I believe from ABC you saw a lot of. So uh, I wanted to just mention Daryl Dragon. He also was an incredible musician. Um, he played with the Beach Boys for a little while and just a phenomenal. They used to have segments on his show where he would just have an instrumental number and he was just incredible on the piano or the synthesizer and i i just thought he was magical i always thought his his greatest uh, claim was when i remember listening to the song muskrat love and anybody now that song yeah i know some of you are groaning right now um and uh but i love the song it, it's dorky it's cheesy but there's a moment in the middle of the song where he uses his synthesizers to make the muskrats talk to one another and Daryl Dragon not only just makes them talk to one another, but he makes them actually convey emotions. And it's almost heartbreaking. And I know some people probably think I'm an absolute crazy man right now, but I am so touched by that, that it is great. And I, I don't think he gets uh, recognized as a as a accomplished um, musician but he was. And uh, the last I'll say about Daryl Dragon is um, one of my favorite Captain and Tennille songs uh, was um, a song that was not a single. Uh, it was called Butterscotch Castle. And that song, I'm even tearing up thinking about it right now, uh, is just an amazing, amazingly simple song. It won't be everybody's favorite, but they talk about uh, you know, having a home, you know, everybody needs a home. And it's such a sad song and sad as in, it's not sad, it's uplifting, but it always moves me to tears. It's actually a very happy, infectious song, but it, it's also, you know, kind of bittersweet. Um, yeah, so it's sad that, you know, reading later, the captain and Tennille had some marital issues and they stayed together a lot of the time for, you know, promotion is kind of sad. But uh, I try to think of their happy times. And from what I heard, uh, even though they did have a rough going, you know, and they did eventually get divorced, uh, what made me cry the most was when I heard that. Tennille, Tony Tennille was on by his side when he passed, and any Captain and Tennille fan would have been touched by that. So um, I'm glad that they at least stayed friends through it. Anyhow, check out some Captain and Tennille. It's very poppy stuff, so if you're looking for classic rock, maybe Captain and Tennille is not where to go, but they gave us some great pop music, and uh, yeah, always feel good stuff. The biggest death in the last couple of months that affected me, and I really needed to talk about this one because this this was a big one for me, um, Penny Marshall. And for those of you who do not know, Penny Marshall will most mostly be remembered as Laverne DeFazio on the 1970s slash 80s TV show Laverne and Shirley. Her, along with Cindy Williams, was still to this day, one of my favorite sitcoms. And even though when I watch old episodes and I realize how ridiculous they are or silly, they still make me laugh. And I think it's the chemistry between Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams that definitely made that show a hit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Laverne and Shirley was actually a spinoff of Happy Days. Happy Days actually had Laverne and Shirley in, I think, two episodes, and they got the idea to spin them off. And when they did, the early episodes, they have real thick... It's funny, because um, Cindy Williams joked that she had this thick Brooklyn-type accent, uh, and it 
went away by season two, but she always thought it was kind of weird that the producers let her have that because of the fact that she, they were Milwaukee girls. There was no reason why had they had these thick accents. Um, I'll talk a little more about Penny Marshall and Laverne and Shirley, but I do want to mention that Penny Marshall actually was a semi-regular on The Odd Couple before Laverne and Shirley. And um, and when Laverne and Shirley did get spin off from Happy Days, uh, it actually became a bigger hit than Happy Days and was actually the number one show after a while. Uh, it t- took nothing for people to become big fans, and uh, I was one of them. Um, uh, another thing I want to touch upon before I start rambling on about Laverne and Shirley is Penny Marshall was also a very big, successful film director. She directed movies like Big, Awakenings, A League of Their Own. Like, we're talking big, big movies, and a lot of people forget about that. You know, because most people know her as, you know, that Italian girl with the L on her sweater. But, no. Penny Marshall went on to direct some some not only big hit movies, but movies that featured people who went on, like Tom Hanks and, and, and you know, Madonna and Rosie O'Donnell, people who went on in their career. And she saw something in them and, and did that. But as I said... You know, definitely check out some of her films because she did a lot of great ones. But she, I understand, um, a lot of people grew up with Laverne and Shirley. And so she will always be remembered mostly for Laverne DeFazio. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I loved Laverne and Shirley so much that I remember even one Halloween, me and my friend uh, David Masalio dressed up as Laverne and Shirley. Uh, I was Laverne and he was Shirley. And I remember having my mom's old wig on and having the shirt where she, you know, stitched that infamous L on. And I remember loving getting to be Laverne and Shirley. That might even be almost pre me knowing I was gay. So I probably enjoyed dressing up as a woman and didn't even realize it yet. But Laverne and Shirley was just a funny, funny show. And these two women worked so well together. And I think, like, as I said, you watch it now and it's very premature and, and it may not premature, but, you know, immature is the word I'm looking for. And it's, it's, you know, old school sitcoms, but as I'm getting older, those are the kinds I really like. And it's, it still makes me smile. There's some episodes that I just, I consider some of the best, you know, comedic TV that's ever been on the air. My favorite, favorite episode is an episode where Laverne and Shirley get invited to a big, big dance, like a fashionable dance, and they can't afford the tickets. So they go as lab rats to this place, and Laverne is uh, they have to choose because they have to go into different programs and Laverne is sleep deficient for a couple of days to get this money for the tickets. And Shirley is um, hunger. She has to go without food. So one's going out with sleep and one is food. And they go to this ball and they're so excited to be going to be seen. And, uh, you know, obviously Laverne's always falling asleep. Uh, Shirley is starving to death and can't get to the buffet table. If you get a chance to see this episode or even just that clip, it, it's definitely worth it. It's one of my favorites. And they've had so many great um, episodes in there, too. Sadly, I always was sad to hear about the fact that apparently they didn't always get along, the crew. And it was actually a hard set where Happy Days crew was always happy and like one big family. You know, Lenny and Squiggy, those actors, a lot of them had a hard time. And and, and it's too bad because that show is so good. And what's even worse is they eventually changed the format. They went from Milwaukee and decided maybe if we move the girls out to L.A. and put the show into the 60s, you know, maybe we'd get a feel. show was still a big success, but they decided to tamper with it. At the beginning, it wasn't too bad. The L.A., 
Hollywood episodes weren't too bad, and they got a chance to put Laverne and Shirley in, in different situations which added to comedy. But unfortunately, it would start going crazy. It got even to the point with Laverne and Shirley, the last few seasons are almost unwatchable. And that's only because of the fact that um, um, basically they just wanted to end it. They had enough for syndication, but the show was still pretty popular and they just forced them to stay in their contract. Eventually, Cindy Williams left because her contract was done. And so Laverne and Shirley actually ran with just Laverne and the back cast. By the last few episodes, Penny Marshall left, and so there was no Laverne and Shirley on Laverne and Shirley. But you know what? She left us very great episodes. And from what I've heard, uh, her and Cindy Williams have had made up years, years after that, and, and just kind of remembered the good times. And that to me just makes it all worthwhile penny marshall was a very unique actress she had an, her own unique look she was pretty without being drop dead gorgeous she had her own unique way her voice was very nasally she played it up even more as laverne defazio um, there was always a sweetness to her character even though she was kind of the wild and crazy and sex mad uh, she had a sweetness at certain times with you know her father, uh, and other characters on the show. The thing I love most about uh, Laverne and Shirley, and when I watch it with my partner, Mike, we always kind of get this lump in our throat when we talk about it because of the fact that uh, there's always a moment in Laverne and Shirley. Uh, the thing I love about the early seasons is the whole thing about Laverne and Shirley is they're working class girls. They work at Schott's Brewery and they were always looking to better themselves, finding Mr. Right, trying to get better jobs. They were always trying to better themselves and they'd always be knocked down by life. And at the end, the sad music would come in, and Mike and I would always be like, you know, sometimes even look at each other, or sometimes even hold each other's hands, because we knew the lesson was coming when the sad music came, and they'd try to build each other up, sometimes even singing the old song, High Hopes. And, uh, yeah, I am so proud to be a Penny Marshall fan, and uh, I'm going to have to rewatch some of those movies she directed, because I even forgot that she did do them until somebody mentioned, hey, remember she did a whole bunch of movies in the late 80s, early 90s that were really big hits. So anyhow, there's my tribute. I'm not going to talk any more about death for a while. Um, hopefully no other big celebrities die, but unfortunately that's what happens. Anyhow, I'm going to take a short break because I kind of got a little nasally there because I got a little emotional during those. And when I come back, I'm going to do a mishmash of entertainment stuff that's been in the news, things going on. I'm just going to talk openly, honestly. If I have time, I might even do a movie review. I got to see a brand new movie out, and it's not often I get to see a movie that's fairly new. Well, no, don't get me wrong. I do get to see the big blockbusters when they come out, but when I get a critically acclaimed film that I get to see. Uh, so I am going to try to squeeze that review in. It'll be my first one of the year. And... Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit of everything. I'm going to try to talk about, you know, how Aquaman's kicking ass at the box office. We're going to talk about the three movies that I don't admire this year because they have huge things to accomplish. Uh, we'll talk about Bohemian Rhapsody winning the Golden Globes. We might talk a little Elvira. We might talk a little Olivia. We will definitely talk about... Did Grover really say the F word on uh, Sesame Street? And uh, as I said, might squeeze a review in there. Thanks for listening to this episode. We're going to take a break, and I'll be back on the other side with a whole bunch of entertainment and nostalgia to talk about with you. And now, meet the star of our show. Symbol of a treat that quality made famous. America's most famous ice cream treat, Eskimo Pie. Creamy, delicious ice cream made even more exciting with smooth, rich chocolate coating and wearing the label of quality known the world over. Eskimo Pie, the treat you know is tops because it carries its pledge of quality right on the back of the bag. Be sure you save the bags for valuable premiums. 
Get famous Eskimo pie at our refreshment stand now. It's America's anytime taste treat. Finest ice cream, finest chocolate. It's delicious. Welcome back to Devlin's Mondo Nostalgia Radio show. Yeah, just weird when I don't put the show at the end of it like it's just an actual radio. Anyhow, before we get to all that stuff I told you I was going to talk about, sorry, i got to take a drink. I was snacking and some of the snack wasn't going down, so I needed to take a drink. Thank you. And before we get to all that, do you ever... I don't know why I'm even talking about this, because it's my show. I can talk about just about anything. Do you ever have, like, a, a, a box of snacks or, like, a cookies that you bought but weren't very good? And so you buy other snacks, and then for some reason you don't throw that box out. And then what happens is when you run out of the good snacks, you're, like, looking for stuff. And then suddenly you're like, oh, yeah, let's try those cookies again. And then you keep eating them. And then you're like, oh, why did I buy those? But you keep them in the thing. Because they're still good, and they still might... Well, that's the kind of cookies I had. I had some gingerbread things that I thought would be really good, and yeah, they weren't. But anyhow, they filled my need, so I'm done snacking. I want to talk about stuff. Let's get started with... Um, let's get the ridiculous one out of the way first. Uh, Grover swearing. This was an intimate uh, sensation last week, I believe it was, where everybody thought they heard Grover saying, Fuck! I was going to just say, you know, the F word, but then I realized, well, why? We're listed as an adult show, so we're all mature here. Fuck. Anyhow, yeah, Sesame Street, Grover saying the word fuck. Now, first of all, I want to say how ridiculous it is that anybody would think that this show that's been on since the late 60s would just allow Grover to swear like that. That being said, uh, I, I don't have the clip, so you're going to have to go check it out yourself. I listened to this clip a few times, and yeah, he sounds like he's saying fucking. And I know he isn't, because they wouldn't let something like that slide. But it, you know, it blew up, and everybody's talking about it. And, you know, the way I see it is Grover's probably one of the Muppets that would say fuck first. You know, maybe Oscar would be slightly higher, but um, I think Rover would probably be second, I would say. I can't think of, like, you wouldn't hear maybe Ernie and Bert. I can't see them saying it, or Big Bird, or Cookie Monster. You know, I can't say count, you know, the count, you know. I'm going to count how many fucks I give. Um, so, yeah, I would say Grover would be the likely choice, you know, maybe Oscar slightly higher. But, you know, it's ridiculous to think that. But it's also funny to hear because it does sound like he's saying fucking in it. And it's uh, it's pretty strange. Now, I, I looked. I couldn't find um, uh, the children's television workshop coming out with an official statement. They probably thought, this is ridiculous. We're not even going to say anything. But I have seen some people interpret it as in maybe that's what they thought he said but i have to be honest with you i believe that grover did not say it but it does sound like he says it okay so i am gonna go with yes it does sound like it but what i have to say is what people are saying he did say does not sound at all like what he says. In fact, I listen to it over and over again, and they claim he says fun stuff. But there is no fun stuff in there. And so I'm just going to put it out there that they need to come up with a better story. Maybe he said flipping or fricking. But the fun stuff does not fly with me. So until then, I'm going to just say that Grover said fuck. And leave it at that, even though I know he didn't. But it's fun. It's fun that way. Anyhow, I I grew up being a big fan of Aquaman. Now, contrary to popular belief, he was not my favorite superhero. I always was a big Batman fan growing up. And then when I got a little bit older, maybe in my late 30s, I became a Superman fan. And that was only because of the fact that I 
identified with Superman more than I did Batman. But I've always been a huge Aquaman fan. And when you're an Aquaman fan, it is very hard because of the fact that you get no respect. And for the longest time, Aquaman has been the butt of all jokes. Like, everything. Entourage even made a running gag about an Aquaman movie. And, and they did it mostly because it was tongue-in-cheek. Because it's like, that's the most ridiculous thing to have. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because Aquaman debuted a couple of weeks ago at the box office with Jason Momoa in the role. Now, we've already seen him play Aquaman. He did a quick little snippet in Batman vs. Superman, but he got a prominent role in Justice League. And now, I was a fan of Justice League, but I know a lot of people weren't. But a lot of people agreed that they thought Jason Momoa kicked ass as Aquaman. Arthur Curry. So when his movie came out, I didn't know what to expect. The DC Universe, although I have become a big fan of it, has not exactly gotten a lot of love. You know, Wonder Woman did. Some people liked Man of Steel. And besides that, it's the most divisive franchise out there. Some people love it. Some hate it. So when Aquaman came out, it started off getting... Pretty good reviews, although there were some people that didn't love it. They just liked it. I wasn't sure how it was going to perform at the box office. Uh, I knew this was a good time to release it. They released it around Christmas, and there was no Star Wars movie to contend with. And, you know, its biggest competition was either coming from Mary Poppins Returns, which is a totally, totally um, different audience sometimes and then the other side of it was bumblebee and i know that's closer to the aquaman uh demographic but i knew bumblebee was also playing to more of a younger crowd and also that's another universe that has had its share of lumps thanks to the michael bay transformers movies now all three movies have done good but what everybody's blown away of is how big Aquaman has become. In fact, Aquaman is breaking box office records as we speak. It right now is the biggest DC shared universe movie, beating out Wonder Woman and Batman vs. Superman. So, here is a superhero that has always gotten, you know, people always handing him his balls to him and being treated like a second-class citizen, and he is raking up money and who knows even by the time and we're talking on a worldwide scale he's making lots of money here domestically but we're talking by the time this posts on from where i'm filming it to when we air it there's a good chance aquaman may have crossed the billion dollar mark now not a lot of movies have crossed that billion dollar mark and the fact that aquaman might be one of them is mind-blowing the fact that we're actually talking about an Aquaman sequel and we still haven't had a standalone Batman film in this universe. The fact that we're talking about an Aquaman film and we still don't have talk of a Superman film from Man of Steel. So suddenly I just had to put it out there that Aquaman is is kicking some serious butt at the um, box office right now. So yeah, I'm... So happy to say I was an Aquaman fan before, and I'm glad he's doing very well. Uh, three movies coming out in 2019. Um, I haven't really looked at the movies coming out yet, but I know there's a lot of great ones. I'm looking forward to, like, Glass. I'm looking forward to, you know, Captain Marvel. I'm looking forward to the next Spider-Man movie. But there are three movies that are coming out that... I think have got some big challenges ahead. And, um, yeah, I don't know which one of these movies should be worried most. Well, I think I know what I would say it would be. I think all of them will make money, but all of them have big, big <sighs> accomplish accomplishments that they need to succeed at. And, I'm not saying they're not up to the task, but there's some big, big movies coming out that are are guaranteed to make money, but not guaranteed 
to win fans. Okay, up first, coming up in, I believe it's May, unless they push it up to April like they did the last one, we have Adventures Endgame. Now, we saw the trailer for this, a teaser trailer, a couple of weeks ago, and it looks phenomenal. Uh, they didn't reveal too much, but they, in some ways they revealed one or two things that were quite shocking. Now, this has been long said to be basically the end of the MCU that we know of. And then the next phase will follow, you know, characters like Black Panther and Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, and, and a lot of the newer things. Even though we still have a couple of, you know, like we have a Guardians to look forward to and stuff, we know that they're going to be taking us into new realms. So we know some of these movies are coming, but Marvel's kept a couple of them close to their chest because they don't want to reveal if we're going to have any major casualties. The reason this is such a big movie is the fact that, um, yeah, it's it had such a huge cliffhanger at the end of it that it it's got to nail the finale. It's got to nail the finale. And the fact that we know that some of the characters that were in peril are coming back in future movies, you know, the fact that we know there's a Spider-Man movie coming out in July, unless they're doing it from the past, which I don't think they are, we know somehow Spider-Man's coming back. So are they going to turn people off if suddenly they're just going to, all the people that had their lives in jeopardy you're suddenly just gonna everything's gonna be fine or will they be changed by the experience it'll be interesting to see how they deal with it i know they're gonna make a ton of money at the box office but i think this could be a really hard movie to nail the first one was so loved and so if they give us something generic though they are going in the same people who did um infinity war are doing end game so that's always a plus and another plus is that thanos was just such an incredible villain in the last one i talked about it last week in my top 10 movies i think they might be in a good place but still not an easy movie to have to follow up but luckily we don't have to wait like three years like we used to with the you know old star wars movies and we only had to wait a year and from now we only have a couple months to wait so I'm really I really wish the Russo brothers a lot of luck on that one because they've got a lot to deal with the other movie second movie is it part two this is coming out in September and uh, the first one became a global phenomenon it's of course based on the Stephen King novel and the novel is kind of a really long movie now when they did a miniseries they did two nights because it's too much to do and they didn't they cut it in half because there was no way the movie was going to tackle everything now a little bit of spoilers here so if you want to just go forward a bit if you don't want to hear it in the second movie all the kids that survived the first one are now going to be grown-ups because it takes place something like 27 years, I think it was. Because uh, that's, you know, what the story of Pennywise is. So all the kids that we kind of loved in the first movie, and the kids were some of the best things about it. I love the It movie, but they got cast so incredibly. So now we have to buy adult versions of them. And again, I think it will make a lot of money, but another hard movie to land because of the fact that the first one was just so good. But now we have to invest in the people that they cast as the adult versions. Now, I think we are going to see some flashbacks with the younger versions, so I think that'll help the transition. But still very difficult, because if we don't fall for those adult versions or those characters we fell for in the original movie could be dealing with a very bad situation. If I recall when I watched the original miniseries with Tim Curry, I actually think the first part is a stronger part. Now, I haven't read the book, and I don't know anything about it, so I'm not saying it because of that, but I remember that the second part is a little bit harder to nail, and I really wish them the best. We're going in with the same director, so that's a positive, and... Um, 
Yeah, I wish them the best on that. The third and final movie that's almost got an impossible job ahead of it is, of course, coming in December 2019, a little movie called Star Wars Episode Nine. We don't have a name yet for it. I know some people are saying that the Knights of Ren is a possibility, but that's just rumor. So I'm not saying I'm not saying I know something, but that's what I've heard. It could be, uh, it could be anything. You know, you know, Star Wars. They like to surprise. It could be, you know, the Ewoks return or something. And I don't know. Um, but anyhow, the reason this one, of course, has some big, um, a big job ahead of him. And JJ is coming back. Um, he did the Force Awakens, and then Ryan Johnson came in and did the Last Jedi. And you know my feelings on the Last Jedi, but it's not just my feelings. Um, his movie, Last Jedi, basically divided the Star Wars universe and did something that we haven't seen in the Star Wars universe. People may have hated the prequels, but a lot of people were in agreement with the prequels. Uh, but The Last Jedi, some people love it, some people hate it. So it was a very polarizing film, and it split the Star Wars community in half. Uh, normally, that wouldn't be such a bad thing, but the fact that Disney already seen what casualties it brought, because Solo paid dearly because of that. A lot of people stayed away from it to show their um, dis lack of faith in um, where Disney's taking the new movies. Now, again, this movie's going to make a ton of money, so it doesn't really matter, but J.J. has to come in and take over. And the one thing I had the biggest problem with The Last Jedi is everything J.J. worked for to create a brand new trilogy, Ryan Johnson pretty much stamped out. And so now J.J.'s got to come back and bring it all around again. And I, I think this is the most daunting of the three movies. Because I don't... Even though I didn't agree with a lot of the stuff that The Last Jedi did, I don't want J.J. to just come in and retcon everything and, and try to bring it back to where it was. I think you have to um, deal with what they've given us and find a way to get some of those fans back. I have to admit, I'm not really excited about number nine, but I have a feeling when I see that first trailer, which could hit at any time, you know, we might get something, though I think they're going to be kind of holding off as long as they can. We're still a year away from it, so they really have no rush. But, um, you know, when they show that first trailer, I could get that feeling of, okay, let's wrap this up. I hope I do, because I hate not being excited about a Star Wars movie, which I am right now. Uh, Solo kind of brought a little bit of that spark back to me. But, um, yeah, uh, I wish J.J. the best on this, because this would be horrible if it just kind of falls flat. And J.J. doesn't always pull off trilogies very good. Um, but I think, you know, he might land this one. I'm definitely going to give it a chance, but as I said, just not feeling it right now. A uh, couple of little things to talk about. Golden Globes were just revealed. I won't um, go too much into them. You can always go online to see who won. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody surprised everybody by winning the Best Dramatic Picture. Uh, that and A Star is Born went into the Globes and said, uh, like, because the Golden Globes, they have best drama, then they have best musical and comedy, and both Star is Born and Bohemian Rhapsody said that they want to compete in the dramatic area and um, not the musical and comedy because, well, the Golden Globes musical comedy can be somewhat of a joke sometimes. Movies like The Martian and Get Out have been thrown in there just to give it something. Um, but... What was weird is when this first was announced, everybody thought A Star is Born was going to be the one to take the win. And Bohemian Rhapsody pulled out a win, which is very shocking. Like, I think a lot of people thought Remy Malek playing Freddie Mercury would definitely get the win for the, for the best actor, but that even wasn't guaranteed. What makes this big is, well, you know, for anybody who listened to last week, Bohemian Rhapsody was my favorite movie of last year. And the weird thing is the controversy behind it because of its director, Brian Singer. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody um, 
won a couple of major awards that night. Nobody was thanking Brian Singer. There's no way they could have because I don't want to get into it, but Brian Singer's up for a lot of allegations and they're not pretty ones. Uh, if you want to read about it, that's fine. I, I don't want to personally discuss it. Um, but I do give Brian Singer a little bit of, you know, he did make this movie and that, and he should get some acknowledgement for that. But at the same time, I understand why Hollywood's kind of backing away from it. But I am a little ticked too, because from what I'm reading about a lot of these cases, is that a lot of Hollywood knew about this stuff and stayed quiet about it for so many decades. And not just talking about Brian uh, Singer, I'm talking about all these cases. Even the ones that we don't even hear about that much, you know, I'm glad they're being brought to light. But I am kind of a little shocked that Hollywood has kept these secrets and now everybody's jumping on this... Uh, Let's destroy this person's career now. And I get it. They deserve to be punished for what happened. But I don't know. The fact that a lot of people stayed stone about a lot of this going on. I won't get into it because it's pretty deep. But I'm very happy Bohemian Rhapsody won. And it shows that, yeah, the director might be a shit. And maybe you know, done some stuff that I hope he pays for if it turns out that he's guilty. But we have to sometimes realize that they can still create art. We don't have to just burn everything that they did before. Um, we just don't have to, like, idolize or worship the person behind it, but they still left us a legacy of art. And so uh, congratulations to Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, as you most people know, who are regular fans of mine, uh, I'm a big Olivia Newton-John fan. And I just want to bring this up quietly and quickly because uh, I saw the, over Christmas, I saw the National Enquirer. Not that I look at it and say, you know, oh my God, you know, that must be true. It's on the National Enquirer. In fact, to be honest with you, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, I used to look at the National Enquirer, but now I don't at all. But I couldn't help but notice that they had a big news story right on their front cover about how Livy Newton-John is on death's door. She's gone back to her ranch and, and gone back to her ranch to die, basically. And I was bothered by this because I have a sense that she might not be with us for a long period of time. Um, when she released her book and she had an interview on Australian TV, um, I just got the feeling that, you know, she's always been one to like bring bad news, but also to kind of hide things. Do you know what I mean? Like, she doesn't get too personal in her life. In fact, I've noticed lately when I watch her interview, she answers the questions very professionally, but doesn't go diving into it too personal. In fact, a few times, like I remember when she talked about cancer, they asked her, you know, do you, do you have moments where you fall apart? And she literally looked at the interview and she says, of course, I'm human, but I'm not going to fall apart in front of you. And I love that. It was kind of a classy way. I hope I could get to that. But in the back of my mind, I thought, oh, geez, this promotional campaign, her coming out and everything feels so final that I was starting to worry about it. So when I saw the National Enquirer, I just kind of tried to not think about it. But on um, just after or just before New Year, she released a video where she let people know that she's feeling fine. She is not at death's door. She has a lot of projects coming up she's hoping to work on and that she just wanted people to know and hear it from her, which shows me just how classic and awesome a lady she is because she wanted her fans to hear it from her because, you know, and she looked wonderful in the video. If you're a fan of Olivia, I definitely go check it out. And it's a very short clip, but she just wanted people to know that she's, you know, she's fighting her third bout with cancer. And even though it's a really serious bout, she claims she is doing very well and already looking forward to get back on the stage and work on other projects. So that's great. Uh, I'll talk about one more thing before I am going to try to squeeze a review in here. Um, it was a movie I wasn't really, 
I didn't love as much as everybody else is, so I think I can squeeze in a quick review of it. But first I want to talk about Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Cassandra Peterson uh, recently did a Q&A, and she was asked about a couple of projects, and the reason I want to talk about this is because I'm a big Elvira fan, and she mentioned two things that really excited me, and... Uh, I want to talk about them, even though they're long shots. Uh, one of my favorite films by her is, uh, she only did two as far as I know. She did Haunted Hills and she did a movie back in the 80s called Mistress of the Dark, which is one of my favorite cult movies. I recently got to share it with uh, Damien, and you can look up the Damien and Devlin show for a review of that, because it is a really great review. And uh, Anyhow... She talked about doing a sequel, and she had been shopping it around, and she's been teasing the fact that she has great ideas for it, and she would like to do it. And she makes it sound like we might actually see a sequel for this over 30-year-old comedy that I absolutely thought was goofy, ridiculous fun. But we might actually see a sequel to that, because Haunted Tales wasn't really a sequel. It was kind of its own movie. And with all due respect to... Uh, Cassandra Peterson, she is, it wasn't really as good as Mistress of the Dark. So, yeah, I really look forward to this. The other thing she kind of hinted at is if movie, her movie Macabre was going to show back up again, because she, there was rumors she was talking to Netflix, and all she said was she's working on it. Now, this doesn't know if this means she's going to be making new episodes. Horror is definitely on an upswing with all the, you know, the big horror movies that have been out late, lately, like It and Get Out and Quiet Place and Hereditary and, you know, you know, Escape Room, all that kind of stuff. But, um, or if that means that she's going to be releasing all her old episodes, because she did a, a, a show in the 80s and the 90s, and then she did a revamped one about 10 years ago. And so I don't know if that means that Netflix is going to get all those, or if she's going to be making new ones, but when Elvira says she's working on it, she's working on it. She looks amazing. for She's close to Olivia's age. They're both close. I think they're both in their 70s, and they still look amazing. And uh, I really wish Elvira the best. And the more Elvira we can get, the better it is. Anyhow, I'm going to squeeze a review in here. Uh, I don't get to see uh, independent films too much. As you remember in my top ten, there were two smaller films, Shape of Water and Call Me By Your Name. They were 2017 films, but we didn't get them until 2018. So... One of the big movies everybody's talking about, Oscars, last, it, it won the Golden Globe for Best Foreign Film, is a movie called Roma, and it was directed by Alfonso, I'm going to get this wrong, Curon, Curon, I could be wrong, anyhow, Saron, anyhow, he is a huge um, director, he's done movies like Why Tu Mama Te Bien, uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azaban, Children of Men, and Gravity, to name a few. Roma is his latest foreign language film, and it is getting rave reviews. Uh, the little theater that I go to that sometimes shows things actually got a special chance to air this, and I got to see it. So this is one of those movies I actually got to see before the Oscars. And... I wish I loved it as much as Shape of Water and Call Me By Your Name. Uh, it's a really interesting film. Uh, it basically follows the life of this housekeeper who works for an affluent family who has, I believe, four kids, if I recall. And the father has to leave on business for what turns out to be several months. And we basically follow the lives of this housekeeper and her relationship with the family as she's going through her own personal stuff. It's shot in black and white. It's also, you can see it on Netflix. So even though I got to see it on the big screen, I do not have Netflix. So that's the way I saw it. So I, I paid to go see this. And um, if you have the chance, you can check this out on Netflix. You don't have to wait. I believe it's there. And I give credit to this movie because it is two hours and 15 minutes, and I, I found it kind of interesting. You know, I visually, it is interesting to watch, because uh, 
for good 60, 70 minutes of the film, it's just like everyday life. There's not much going on. Even when stuff does go on, most of it is just regular life stuff. Um, and although I did find it an interesting movie to watch, I cannot say that I was touched by this film. Uh, I did think there were some very beautiful shots in it. Uh, I think the actors were all really interesting. I liked seeing the housekeeper with the different relationship she had in the house, from the kids to the mother, to even to some degree to the father, and how her personal life plays out. Um, this movie never really gets a heartbeat too much. I didn't really fall for the characters because it just basically it was like watching a reality show that was beautifully filmed and we didn't get much meat on any of the stories now i do have to say one thing about this there is one incredible shot here uh, i don't want to give it away but it takes place in a hospital and it basically just holds on one shot for quite a long time and it is an amazing piece of film work in fact that shot alone probably makes it worth your while and probably the reason why it's getting such critical acclaim i personally don't know if i'll ever watch roma again i love that i got the chance to see it i know exactly what it was going for i love that it's doing so well and people are talking about it this is an art film and for people who are not fans of art film, you are going to probably not enjoy it. Uh, as I said, it takes a lot to get into it. Uh, I did, was enraptured even in times when nothing was happening. I like movies sometimes where they just take their time. Uh, but this um, just didn't hold my attention a lot. It was just kind of... Yeah, I get the artistic side of it. I know what they were going for. But for me, I was not invested in the characters enough. I found them interesting, but not to the point where I really cared. Or once they faded off the screen, did I care if I ever saw these people again? And when I see a really good film, whether it's a blockbuster or independent, it's like, oh, I want to know more of the story. I want to know what happens. Or even in my head, I start writing the story. This director, Alfonso Curran, has directed some amazing films. I love Why Tu Mama Te Bien. I love Gravity. Uh, I know people love The Prisoner of Azaban, and I, it's one of my favorite um, Harry Potter movies. I'm still a Goblet of Fire fan, but um, he is a wonderful director, and I love that he's getting all this acclaim. But for me, Roma was a little long in the tooth and just wasn't my my cup of tea. I'm glad I saw it. Um, I'd only recommend it to real movie fans. Um, I can see why some people love it. I, I think it's a little overrated myself, but that's just me and how I feel. Being said, as I said, it's worth the watch if you are a big fan of film, because as I said, the one sequence that takes place in the hospital that never really moves is probably one of the most powerful s scenes I've seen in a movie in a long time, but still not enough to make me just rave about this movie or think, wow, I still got to get through a lot of the movie before I get to see that scene again. So for me, I'm going to give Roma only two and a half out of five stars. As I said, I like art films, but this one almost was a little too much. And, uh, yeah, and if it's your thing, that's great. That's what matters is that you, you know, if you listen to my review, that's fine. But don't take it as, you know, the final word. I'd never want that. I want you to go check it out and see it for yourself. And if you love it, then I'm happy for that. But for me, I have to just give it a right on the middle, two and a half out of five. Anyhow, that's my show. I felt I covered a lot of stuff, but you can tell I've been away. I'm enjoying talking again. Anyhow, I will be back with talking more Mondo Nostalgia stuff. I'll be back talking about more personal stuff. I definitely want to talk about 
situations with relationships. And I do want to have some uh, guests on my show again and just kind of talk. I had a great time. I look forward to seeing you next week. 